steadiest since uh, 2007 or something like that, 10, 11, I don't remember. And uh, it worked great. I mean, it's uh, it's everybody's dream, you know, so when, uh, when the band had the same lineup for years. Uh, unfortunately, our time, it's, uh, or our times, uh, is pretty hard to keep the, the same lineup all the time uh, through eight, nine, ten, whatever years. Uh, the music industry changed a lot, and uh, most of the musicians are involved somehow in different projects. They had to do that. So uh, again, uh, we've been very fortunate in that sense. But in the last uh, eight years, we had the same lineup, and it worked out great. Everybody getting along socially and musically, you know. So it's a pleasure. Well, 
differently than I usually do because uh, the band in the last couple couple of years been pretty busy. So what happened? We released the previous album, The Devil's Dozen, and we went on a festival tour. We went to uh, Rockingham in Britain. We went to Lowell Park in Japan and uh, Prog Power in uh, in the States. And actually, in uh, Prog Power was recorded, so we released a double live album called Cargo. And all the time in between, I was writing songs, and then we'll go away and play this festival track, come back, I'll mix Cargo, the double live album will be released, and then I'll continue writing new material. And then the regular tour came along, uh, spring uh, 2016, and uh, <clears throat> as I said, we visited like 17 or 18 countries, played for almost two months, and one of the shows in uh, Moscow, or in Russia, was recorded. Uh, so we released DVD in 2016, it's like a double live album in DVD and the whole thing. Um, and again, in between all those things I was writing songs, so it gave me, it gave me a possibility to come back and revisit some of the material which I already wrote previously, change it, rearrange it, maybe throw something away yeah, or something new. You know, so I was privileged in that sense but for almost two years on and off I could work on the album. Uh, so we didn't have any fillers on it. Uh, we couldn't weed out all the dead spots or spots we didn't like for some reason. Uh, so it's been a great experience, yeah, absolutely. Instruments, I have some sequencers, I have like laptop so I can write on that. It's pretty easy these days. Uh, but when we are shifting to a recording stage, then the analog gear comes into play, especially on this album. As my studio is built around uh, analog gear, tube gear, uh, tape recorders, and stuff like that. Of course, I have new computers and stuff like that. If, if it's spotty, if it's necessary. But most of it is very warm, nice sounding analog gear recorded to tape. Uh, and that's the main difference when you're composing something than the actual recording. When you're playing live, I have my uh, usual uh, setup. I don't use any software. I have a digital piano, I have a hammer, a couple of synthesizers. Uh, but all of it is analog, you know, because I just like the sound of it, you know, and uh, to me those keyboards is almost like a guitar for a guitar player. Uh, they have specific feel, they have specific sound, and so um, that's how it works. <laughs> source to this level of, of excitement it usually comes when you truly love what you do. Uh, I think it's very simple. I'm excited every time I'm writing a new piece, every time we're recording an album or even when we're going on tour. Uh, music is my life and it's been, it's been here for me for almost like 30 years. And uh, so every time I do something, it, uh, it's, the level of excitement is pretty, pretty high. And as I said, as I was very fortunate to have people around me who share this love for music with me and the same level of energy, excitement for doing something.
being in a band uh, and, and in, in, in general, uh, being in this uh, music, let's call it business, uh, it's hard by itself. I mean, you are obviously self-employed, so it's up to you what's going to happen with the band. You have to be involved, you, you should uh, motivate others, uh, you should find um, good partners to work with. Uh, it's on the business side, it's on the musical side. So it's uh, 99 of those, 99 percent of those things is up to you. So it takes time, and uh, you have to be patient. But as I said, if you love what you do, it's it's not that difficult. Times on uh, when uh, Royal Hunt started, uh, let's say so my career started previously, I mean even earlier, but uh, the Royal Hunt as a band was created around 89 or something like that. It was very difficult to get into the music scene on a professional level because if you remember in the 90s, everything was about grunge and uh, this kind of music, and we came up with this. Uh, symphonic, uh, slightly progressive in places uh, kind of music, uh, which were not, definitely not fashionable at the time, you know. And um, so we were kind of like sitting between two chairs. On one hand, we were not 80s. On another hand, we were not 90s. You know, we were kind of like in between, in that sense. And uh, we were melodic, but kind of, the music was complex. Uh, so it was hard in the beginning. Say the first five or six years, uh, this kind of a fashion thing worked against us because we sounded differently from everybody else. So it was difficult for record companies, it was difficult for journalists to put us where, who are we? Because we have classical music, we have progressive elements, we have classic rock, all combined. And um, it was hard to define who we are for outsiders. Uh, but I think from the mid-90s, late-90s, it became to work for our advantage, or to our advantage, because all of a sudden we were unique and nobody sounded like we did. And still, I don't think there are so many bands who come close to a long time. Of course, I mean, as we uh, talked about the genre, and maybe you can mention different kind of bands who kind of like uh, sound a bit like us, but nobody is sounding like a long and that's uh, one of the things that I tried to achieve from the very, very beginning, uh, like to me, there are very few, very recognizable bands, uh, like Queen, which is still a huge fan of, you know, so you can, you can always hear it's them. Or like Deep Purple, and so you can always hear it's them, or Pink Floyd or something like that, they all sound different. And I always wanted to, to be a part of a band that sound different than everybody else. And after 25 years of music, yeah, we finally achieved that. Even if they keep you down, how many times you see the wolves and trees that keep them brown? I started uh, as a five years old. I mean, it was actually my parents who made me also study piano. And I didn't like that at all in the beginning. So it was very much against my will. Uh, but I had to. So I finished the music school and I'll continue and the whole thing. And then I had a break. So I was finished in the music school. And uh, I said, that's it. I mean, I had this piece of paper and 
Uh, I'll move on and do something else. And then uh, I think I was about 12, uh, 13, I don't remember. And uh, then I heard uh, Deep Purple Rock, uh, which probably had been on the market for a while, but I discovered it later. And that was like turning point. It was that simple. Uh, there was no uh, hesitation. I heard this album and that was it. I knew this is what I want to do. And since that point, like 12, 13 years old, I was kind of like working in that direction. I was listening to a tremendous amount of music. And, uh, and I, as I said, I started with something like Deep Purple, Uriah, Pink Floyd, Queen. And then I kind of discovered all these progressive elements like uh, Genesis and Rush and Kansas and those kind of bands. Yes, of course. And, uh, and plus my classical background, they all kind of melted together and then I started writing my own music. All these three elements were combined in one. Basically because back in the day I couldn't buy a record that sounded like, like that. So I made it myself. It's very important to me, and uh, as I, I explained it a few times previously, uh, I don't write the music and then lyrics like most people do. I mean, I'm not sure, but I guess. Uh, so I'm writing them more or less at the same time because what's very important to me is the atmosphere inside the song, and it's not only music; it's it's, it's words as well. So when I'm writing. A song. If I think I have a good idea, uh, yes, I do. I write melodies and chords and stuff like that. But at the same time, I have words, lines. I, I know what this music will be about uh, in my mind, and it's all not always finished. But I'll always have like pages and pages, you know, of ideas what it is and some lines, and that later will become choruses or verses or something like that. So when I'm done with the song, I basically I've done with both things, it's music and lyrics at the same time. Uh, another thing I can add about the lyrics, you know, so especially in the beginning when we were starting out, everybody was expecting us to write about rainbows and nights and, uh, you know, all this like, kind of like fantasy thing, because uh, probably because some of the bands were playing this power metal, progressive metal, they were writing all these astral things, you know. Uh, I, I've never been into this Dungeons and Dragons, you know, and uh, I've been interested in, in today, in topics which are interesting for me today. And that's why I said, my inspiration for lyrics is coming from everyday life. It, it could be a book, a movie I watch, or it, it could be a headline in a newspaper. You know, so it could be that. It doesn't matter what. I mean, so sometimes you can go to the grocery store and somebody in line so the cashier will say a word or a line or something like that that, that kind of triggers something. So that sounds interesting and then you start working on it and then music appears and the lyrics and music go hand in hand. That's the way I write. Funny story uh, because I, I, I didn't imagine that uh, there was probably some ideas at the time of different covers, but our uh, because the music was taking this turn, uh, some of the guys meant it was a little bit kind of like a back to the roots in a positive way because we were kind of progressing still, but uh, the guys in the band they kind of like sensed there was something from. Uh, 
from an earlier catalog in a way. Maybe atmosphere, maybe, I don't know. But, and then uh, our you know, art designer, he heard about that. And he heard a couple of songs, and he, big fan as well. And uh, so, he, uh, so he suggested to redesign the original Dragon, which we had on the first album, the crest, the whole thing, which became a logo for Rohan. And he, he decided to give it like a 3D new look. You know, so I said, okay, it sounds, sounds, sounds cool, I'm trying. So I didn't expect it to be that cool. So I like, actually, when he came out with that, so oh, it's nice. And then all of a sudden, we had a, uh, we had a title. Because when you can see this monolith, you know, of a dragon on the cover, and then you're talking at the same time with the, uh, your, uh, your music is going a little bit back to the roots. And it's kind of a uh, monument to that. So it's cast on stone. So it became cast on stone automatic. <laughs> since we've been in Greece and uh, I don't remember exactly but I think it was the five or six years or something like that and that's finally uh, we were able to, to play here this pretty famous club guitar in, uh, uh, in Athens uh, sunny city in a sunny country excellent food very nice people around us and uh, in, a, in a venue there are professional people working on that so we're really looking forward to this gig and uh, Hopefully, at some time in the future, we'll be back. Nobody's watching over, so we're getting light. 